let me thank you all for coming. I can't believe that you all paid money to see a 60 year old man wearing B shorts talk about the most hated product on them that was invented in the B industry. So I'm going to go through a little bit of the design, the, the thought process, blah, 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 and then give you some tips and tricks to make your flow hive succeed. Because as you will see in my presentation, it's not the bees that make a flow hive fail, it's the beekeeper that make the flow hive fail. So I'll hopefully be able to help you along the way. So am I meant to change the slides? Maybe. There we go. So yeah, um, flow hive was invented by a father and son duo, Stuart and Cedar. Um, Stuart being an engineer, I'm an engineer, and I know how engineers' brains work, mine never stops. And so they wanted to find a better way to harvest honey that just made it easier. Now, whilst they were inventing this, there may or may not have been a little bit of the green happy herb involved, <laughs> because they are from Byron Bay. But yes, when they finally got onto the model that they wanted and they, they were happy with, they went out to crowdfund. And they crowdfund to try to raise $700,000 to buy the injection moulding machine to make the flow frames. They ended up getting $14 million from crowdfunding because that's how the world took to, to the idea. Now, how did the Basin Backyard end up being the only flow hive agent in Melbourne? We ended up being the only flow hive agent in Melbourne by hanging shit on them on the internet. Okay? So we put up a post because when they first brought out the flow hive, all they ever talked about was how easy it is to harvest honey. They never went into anything else. And so all these people are thinking, wow, all I've got to do is buy this and put it in my backyard and I'm going to get honey. So we put up a post and it was entitled, a beehive is not for Christmas. Exactly the same as the RSPCA did as a dog. We asked the rest of the industry to get on board, but nobody got on board, unfortunately. But our, we had 56,000 likes from that post of, of a beehive is not for Christmas. Monday morning, we got a phone call from Free Flow Hive Legal Department. And I thought, <laughs> might be in a little bit of trouble here. But it was the exact opposite. They loved what we said. And they said, listen, we understand we've made some mistakes. Can you help us? You're the sort of person that, you know, need, we need to help. So, yeah, we became, a, and to date, we're still Australia's only Flow Hive reseller. You either buy it from us or you buy it from Flow Hive. Yes, be keeping clubs, get discounts and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, in terms of retail, we're the retail, flow hives are retail. So yeah, that's, that's how it was. Flow frame technology for those that haven't seen it. Yes, it's plastic. Um, that was one of the biggest problems that the bee industry had with flow hive when it first came out. It's plastic. Here's something that the beehive industry or the bee industry didn't really go into is that commercial beekeepers use billions, and I'm talking billions, of plastic bee frames, plastic sheeting, plastic everything, and yet this small product came out, everybody honed in on plastic. So, you know, it's something that's been used in, bee, in the bee industry for a long time. We use some plastic foundation because when you chuck it in the spinner, you don't get blowouts, so it's, it's a lot, lot better product to use. So, yeah, there were some really unkind things focusing highly and solely on plastic. But as I said, it's already been used and used, used really, really well, well. So why use a flow hive? So as I say to everybody, unless you're David Beckham, and, you, and I don't know if anybody ever watched David Beckham's um, show on Netflix, but it starts off with David Beckham in a field with about 50 flow hives. And I said to myself, holy moly, look at that. There's a half a million dollars worth of flow hive shit. And said, well, he was on $240 million a year, like, of course he's going to have them all. So I say to everybody that comes into the shop to that want to get into beekeeping, they hone in on the on the flow hive, and I'll say, well, here's the question: How many hives do you eventually want? And I give them the story of my one, two, two hundred. But if you only are going to have one or two, then 100% it makes sense to have a flow hive rather than have everything else. But if you're going to have multiples and you're not David Beckham, then yeah, head down the the path of traditional. And as we say in here, the only difference, the only difference between a flow hive and a conventional hive is the way you harvest honey. You still have to be a beekeeper. And as I say, to the, there's, there's two different types of people in this industry. There's beekeepers and there are keeper of bees. And there's a massive difference. And believe me, there's just as many keeper of bees that don't have a flow hive than do have a flow hive. 
but unfortunately, once again, everybody hones in on Flowhive as the bad beekeepers. Do yourselves a favor and open a retail shop one day and wait for all the questions that people are walking with some of their questions and you just think, wow, it, it, your bees have got no hope. <laughs> so yeah, as I said, just as many conventional as there are flow hive that are, that are doing the wrong thing. <clears throat> so <laughs> why don't people like the flow hive? And here we go. Bees don't like plastic. Well, once again, commercial beekeepers use plastic every day of the week right around the world so um, um, that's what I'm saying billions of plastic bee frames um, flow hives need to be coated yeah, the flow frames need to be coated in beeswax I get a lot of people coming in to buy a block of beeswax why do you need that I need to coat my flow frames take a seat give me five <laughs> minutes I'll have a chat and then the biggest problem is the lazy, neglectful beekeeper that as I said they've bought a flow hive thinking that you just need to pop it in the corner do nothing, walk out one day, turn on a tap, and there's the answer. But as I said, there's just as many, just as many, if not probably more, conventional beekeepers doing the wrong thing as the red flow, flow hive beekeepers. So, you know, it's, it's really educational to have a shop. And one day when I retire, I'm going to write a book on <laughs> the questions people come in with. <laughs> it's going to be about this thick. And yeah, you'll all get a good laugh. It'll be a good seller. And as I say there, the biggest critics of Flow Hive have never seen, touched, or had. And that's why we go and do talks in bee clubs and things like that to take a Flow Hive. We have a Flow Hive here so that people can touch it and see it. And as I call it, when I, when I start off a, a bee talk in a beekeeping uh, um, group, I call it Voldemort. Here is Voldemort. <laughs> You're all Harry Potter. By the end of the time I finish here, Voldemort's not going to injure you. So... Yeah, it, it, that's just the way, it's an easy analogy. Now, there's a big statement up there, and I want you to look at that statement. And it says, bees don't make a flow hive fail, and they don't. The reason the flow hive fail is the beekeeper. And the most, once again, the most critical thing that I've seen with beekeepers, and I'm not going to point anybody out, but I've already had the question today, they just put them on way too early. They get delivered a box that you put together and there's two bee boxes. Well, every time I see a beehive, it's two, high, two boxes, three boxes high. I need to put this thing together and put it, all, put it all together on once. As we all know, it doesn't work. You, even with conventional beekeeping, you start off with one box, you move your way up. But unfortunately, as I said, they don't want to, some of them don't want to do the research. I've now got two bee boxes, I'll put it together. They come in six months later, why isn't it working? Once again, sit down. Try some of our vodka and we'll have a bit of a chat. <laughs> yeah. So once again, beekeepers, do, beekeepers are the ones that make a flow hive fail, pure and simple. Now, there's a really good picture in that box, in that up there, and I've put that one there deliberately because that's why beekeepers make a flow hive fail. There's hardly any bees there. There's no reason for them, no reason whatsoever, for the bees to head up into the flow frames and they don't understand why. So, you know, as I'm saying, tip number one is that the bee population is the most critical part of making a flow hive work. The th first, second one is the first season you put your flow hive together, please forget about honey production. It's about those little buzzing guys. That's all it has to be about you're going to get honey in the second or third season. And once again, that, that happens in, in conventional beekeeping as well. But people just get a little bit too impatient. I have arguments with people in our bee club that, you know, they, they take all the honey they can possibly take and then feed them sugar water through winter. Like, what's the point? You know, it, honey's the bonus. As I said, everybody, beekeeping's great and honey is pure and simply the bonus. Um, consider having two brood boxes. Um, we've got over 200 and something hives and every one of those have two brood boxes, every one. Um, our theory is more bees, more honey. So, you know, if there's more guys out there foraging, they're going to bring back more nectar and your flow hive is going to work a lot better. Join a bee club and join a Facebook group that is flow hive only. And the reason I say that is because once again, 
there's lots of critics out there in conventional beekeeping world. There's one guy that runs a, um, it's Australia's largest Facebook page for beekeepers, and he on the side runs a one for Flow Hive, and all they do is hang shit on Flow Hive on, on that page. Um, so you know, it's just you, you've got to immerse yourself in Flow Hive people. Um, I hate Facebook with a passion. You'll hardly ever see my name in any of the come up in any of the um, Facebooks because, and here's a perfect example that I give people: is you don't know who that person is giving you the advice. We do mentoring. Just everybody laughs at this question when I like this when I make this statement. But a guy gave me his what. His wife, a birthday present was me. <laughs> but that was, when I say me, her teach her how to be a beekeeper. Before she even had one lesson, she was the expert on Facebook giving all the ans answers to questions. I rang the guy and I said, mate, please stop your wife from giving your money back because she's telling everybody the wrong thing. And that's what I'm saying. That's one of the reasons I hate Facebook literally in the first place. But yeah, just immerse yourself in Facebook people. Um, Flow Hive themselves have an awesome Facebook page and Cedar goes live once a week to sh give you Flow Hive tips for free. You, you know, you can watch them on catch up, you can do whatever, but you know, you're getting all these tips from the people that made the product that are trying to help you get the best out of your product. And then, as I say, the very, very last one, find a mentor, whether that be in your beekeeping club, whether that be professional, whether it be whatever, but you always need, no matter what you do in life, you always need somebody behind your back just saying, you're either doing the wrong thing or you're doing the right thing. And it's always good to have that little bit of reassurance or, as I say, somebody just tapping on your shoulder saying, maybe just try it a little bit different and to see what happens. There's the next picture. Perfect time to put the flow box on. The bees aren't going to have a choice but to go up into the flow frame. But one of the other tips, the biggest tip that I can give people that have got a flow hive is to grab an ideal box. So before you put the flow frames on, put your ideal box on and let them start building honeycomb. What a bonus. You're going to get yourself a nice eight frames of honeycomb. When that's three quarters fill, take it off. Put your flow frames on put the ideal box back on top. The bees will crawl through the plastic. They'll finish off the honeycomb because that's what they do. And by the time they finish the honeycomb, the plastic smells like them. They take to it just like that. There's no smell, there's no anything. It smells like us, they take to it just like that. So that's one of the best tips that you can get for getting a brood, a, a flow frame, you know, populated and, and start getting the honey. Um, only ever put the, your brood box on when the when the um, box is so overloaded, and there is you know tip number three: honey's a bonus. Just let them do what they need to do until such time as there there is so much honey there that you know you you have to take it. Me and vegans don't like each other. <laughs> I don't know why. I do. They don't. But one of the problems with vegans is one: they don't eat the healthiest natural food on the planet, but they hate if vegans would come in here with a machine gun and knock us all off because they hate us. And that's when you sit them down and explain to them, but hang on, bees collect three times more food. The only creature on the planet that collects three times more food than it needs. Now, we've all heard of a honey-bound hive. If the hive's honey-bound, where's the queen going to lay her eggs? Goodbye population. So when you sit vegans down and they want to listen, you can actually convert a vegan to start eating some of the best food on the planet. Unfortunately, the Peter ones will never listen to you, but, you know, so as I say to everything, honey is, is, is just the bonus. Beekeeping is the fun, honey is the extra bonus. And then learn all you can about Varroa. Um, yep, we're about to be inundated with Varroa either this, you know, September, October, November this year or early next year. It's going to be, it'll be reported in Melbourne most definitely. Um, I've just had some friends come back from America and over there, they went to have a look at the almond uh, the almond pollination, what, what they did over there. And everybody that said they were Australian, that knew they were Australians, kept coming up saying, oh, we've always heard that you're the lucky country, and now we know why. And they were going, why? We've got Varroa. And they said, yes, but there's no disease. And that's what nobody's focusing on with Varroa. 
everyone's thinking doom, gloom. There is no disease whatsoever in any varroa they've tested to date. Varroa are like a mosquito. If a mosquito bites you and it has Ross River fever, dengue fever, malaria, you're going to cop it. If it bites you and it's got none of those, nothing happens. This little guy's the same. So, yep, we're going to have five or ten years of, you know, managing before potentially any diseases come through. But, yeah, so really, really do learn and do everything that a conventional beehive is, because it is a conventional beehive. It's pure and simply the honey production that is the only difference. I love doing my varroa checks. I've in my bees like gin, I've discovered. Cheaper for me to use gin than it is metho, so so once again, do some training. Learn all about flow hive, learn it and as I say, flow hive themselves have some of the best beekeeping tools for a flow hive owners that there is that there is going around. They have their own system called the beekeeper.org. And you subscribe to the beekeeper.org and they have all these different modules that you can get on in your own time, your own space, and do the modules and, and learn. And as I said, it's more they are now finally more focused on the bees than they are the honey production. So it's been fantastic the the, the massive turnaround that that flow hive themselves are doing rather than you know anything else they you know as i said once again cedar goes live once a week jump on have a look at cedar see what he's doing he does some awesome little things but the one thing i don't like about the flow hive in particular and i'd say that everybody that buys a flow hive is the frames that they give you originally for your brood now, because there's no wire or anything there, and I've seen it happen to cedar two or three times, and you do your proper inspection, guess what happens because there's no wire? So I would say to everybody, start your barbecue with those. Hit, buy a box of wax, you know, fully waxed frames and put those in rather than that, those because, yeah. Imagine doing it on a day like today, tipping it on, you know, 40 degree. It's going to end up straight on the ground. As I said, it's happened to cedar a couple of times, so, yeah. I don't like those frames. Once again, keep them if you want honeycomb, if you want to get some honeycomb. Um, once again, if you, depending on where you live, and that's always the first question I ask people, where do you live uh, before they buy a flow hive? And if they tell me down the Mornington Peninsula, I'd just say, look, you might not want to buy one of those um, because there's lots of tea tree, um, and tea tree is a bit of a bugger to get out of flow frames. Uh, they do have a model called the hybrid, which is, um, has three throw frames and four conventional frames. And if they're down the peninsula, I would say to them, well, don't put those um, flow frames in, put all conventional frames in, get yourself eight frames of honeycomb. Once the T3 stop flowering, take those out, put your flow frames in, and there's not going to be a problem. Um, so same sort of thing. If you, if you know you've got canola around you, <laughs> do not put your flow frames on because you're never getting it out. Never. So, yeah, that's one of the other things that when people come into our shop is how do we get the honey out? Always ask the question, where do you live? Eh, you've got tea tree or you've got canola. So yeah, you, and I was explaining to somebody before, you've really got to learn, no matter what type of beekeeper you are, the area you live in, you've really got to study the flora and fauna, see what's going on. My wife hates me when I'm driving, every second second, she's like, put your eyes back on the road, because I'm driving along like this. I'm trying to see what's flowering. So that I know, you know, do I need to take evasive action for my bees? Do I, yeah, so she hates coming to a drive switch. She drove here today because she knew what I was going to be doing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, really, really learn, learn, particularly flow hive users, what is flowering? What's the predominant tree that will flower in my area so that my flow frames aren't going to get clogged? Because, yeah, you'll never, you'll never get it out. You're going to have to just either feed it back to the bees somehow or pour hot water under it and goodbye and sacrifice the honey because it's yeah, just impossible. So, yeah, no matter, as I say, no matter what sort of beekeeper, really, really learn your area, your five-kilometre radius, What what is going to flower in that five-kilometre radius. I mean, no disrespect, but, you know, a um, lady asked me before about, and I said, well, where do you live? She said, um, can't remember. Kangaroo ground. I said, well, I'm sorry, kangaroo ground finished two months ago. 
nothing gonna no, nothing gonna flare anymore. Two months, you know, the, the yellow box had finished, the red box had finished, the bazaria had finished. There's nothing else to be gotten. So, you know, time to start wintering down your, your bees and I've asked her to go home and take the flow frame straight off because it'll be the best thing that could happen to those bees at this point in time because of what's happening in her area. And the only reason I know that is we, we have 60 beehives around Eltham and I know exactly what's going on in Eltham because it's what I do when I drive, yeah. And as I say, when you guys go out for a drive, just just see what's what's happening. Because, yeah, if some of this stuff gets into your flow frames, it's the end of it. So, yeah, pretty quick talk. Didn't bore... Well, you're gonna get you're gonna get like flowers from gardens and things like that. But the main eucalypt, but, you know, this is why we are the lucky country. Yeah. Well, eucalypt wise, yes, yeah, yeah. Because you know, most countries that struggle to have three or four different varieties of honey, we have hundreds yeah. thanks to eucalypt. So yeah, by watching the eucalypt and when it's their predominant source of it, of food. But, you know, around that area now, none of those eucalypts are going to flower until next season. So, you know, you, you got... No, you can't get it out, but all I'm saying is there's just not going to be any more honey coming in and these bees haven't even moved into the flow frames yet, so get it off. Like, that, nothing's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And we just don't want it on there over winter, basically. So, yeah, the biggest benefit to those bees is to take it off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 